Remain standing, please, as we go in our Bibles to the book of Ruth. Pastor Bramberg will read and pray. The book of Ruth, it follows the book of Judges in your Bibles in the Old Testament. And uh, so if you start there in Genesis, just keep your way. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you get to Judges. The next book is Ruth. And uh, Ruth chapter number 1, just before 1 Samuel, Ruth chapter 1. And I'll begin reading in verse number 16. We'll read down through verse number 18. Book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left speaking unto her. Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd add your blessing to these scriptures that we've read today. Thank you for this book and for the, the portion here. I pray you'll be with our pastor now as he speaks. I pray you'd give him just great power and clarity as he speaks. Help us to listen attentively to this morning. And may we be responsive to the scriptures as you speak to our hearts. I pray you would settle us and just focus us now on thy word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Not every holiday... Uh, not every, you got me there? Not every holiday I preach a uh, specific message to the holiday. For example, on the 4th of July, which happens to be my birthday, <laughs> I don't always preach a patriotic message, although many times I do. Uh, Father's Day, I'm not always want to preach on fathers. Christmas, generally I'll preach a Christmas message, but sometimes it comes around this way. Groundhog Day, I don't preach about groundhogs. <laughs> Halloween, I don't preach about ghosts and goblins. But here in this ancient passage of Jewish history, Ruth becomes many things to us. The book of Ruth is uh, a seldom preached book. It really is. It, uh, it has a lot of types and symbols and a lot of messages for us as well. And I'm saying that to you because uh, the casual Bible reader would come to the book of Ruth and wonder, what does this all mean? It's central, has a central message about Judaism in that God preserved the Jews when otherwise they would have been exterminated. Some have referred to the book of Ruth as the Old Testament Holocaust attempt because the Jews were about to be completely annihilated because of Haman, that man who conspired against the Jews to have them executed and removed from the earth. But Ruth demonstrates quite a few things for us, and this isn't the message, but I'm giving you a, a, a peripheral understanding of this simple, small Old Testament book. Ruth, for example, demonstrates God's, God's love for all people because Ruth was not a Jew. She was a Moabitess. And if anybody here has studied anything about Moab and the history of Moab toward Israel, Moab was not a kind place to the Jew. But God loved her despite the fact that she was a Moabitess. Ruth secondly pictures God's providence. She pictures God's love or demonstrates God's love, but she pictures God's providence in that God guided her steps. And isn't it wonderful to know that God is in the business of fatherly guidance for his children today, guiding our steps. And Ruth, this uh, Moabitess, uh, falls into the place of God's divine provision where otherwise she would have never, ever entered into that relationship with Boaz, that kinsman redeemer. And God planned her steps. God plans your steps. No one here is a self-made man or self-made woman. There is a Father in heaven who guides the steps of mankind, and he's leading the way. Not only that, but Ruth is also the Old Testament equivalent to the Gentile church. You say, really? Because she was given a status and a union that otherwise she should have never had. And she got it from her marriage to Boaz. Yeah. Boaz being a Jew. And she married into that relationship and her union with Boaz. 
And it so beautifully pictures the fact that you and I were lost in sin and unworthy of grace and mercy. And because Jesus came on the scene and he brought to us a wonderful redemption relationship. Beautiful pictures in the Old Testament. By the way, finally, Ruth brings to us a tremendous addition to the lineage and the ancestry of Jesus himself. You say, how could a Moabitess, a Gentile, be brought into the lineage of the Messiah? I'm glad you asked, because when she married Boaz, she became part of that lineage that resulted in David and then Solomon. And you go down the line, ultimately Jesus himself and Ruth is listed in the lineage of Jesus Christ. She's a wonderful woman. But here's what I want to preach about this morning. How Ruth also teaches us how to honor our mothers. My message this morning is titled, How to Honor Your Mother. I want to know how to honor her. By the way, honoring your mother is not spending $7.99 for a card. I can't believe what cards cost. Joe Biden? <laughs> Everything's getting more expensive. I mean, $7.99. I'm, I'm making up my mind from now on, Brother Carr, I'm going to handwrite all cards <laughs> and then sell them to you for $29.95. <laughs> Just call 1-800-HELP-ME-CARD. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. But she teaches us how to honor mother. This world today does not elevate and honor motherhood like it should. As a matter of fact, you consider today uh, this attack on motherhood. I'm certainly not here to preach on current events, but it is interesting to me in 2020, a woman by the name of Michelle Williams, I have no idea who she is, but I found this statement from hers at the 2020 Golden Gloves Award, Golden Globes Golden gloves. You know what's on my mind. <laughs> Boxing's on my mind, amen. The Golden Globes Award speech, 2020, Michelle Williams, she said this, I wouldn't have been able to do this without employing a woman's right to choose, even as she stood there well with child. She said, I wouldn't have achieved this, whatever the Golden Globes is all about, if I didn't have an abortion. She was crediting abortion to her success. Think of the irony of that. Think of the stupidity of that. So we celebrate and elevate and honor motherhood. I'm going to try that again. I said we celebrate and elevate and honor motherhood. The story of Ruth is one of a, a necessary part of the life of Jesus the story of Ruth is one of a virtuous woman. You say, how do you see that? It's interesting. She's called a virtuous woman. In the Hebrew Bible, and when I say the Hebrew Bible, I'm talking about the Bible of the Jew. It's interesting. The order of scriptures is different in the Jewish Bible than our King James Bible. You should know this. But Proverbs 31 is that great chapter that we call the virtuous woman, right? That's a great chapter. You know, in the Hebrew order of Bible books, the very next book after Proverbs 31 is Ruth. And so it's almost as if it's saying, here's the Proverbs 31 woman, and Ruth is introduced. Certainly a virtuous woman. Ruth is a woman who knew how to honor a mother. You say, where do we see her mother in this book? Not really her mother, her mother-in-law. But I think in that same case, be it mother or mother-in-law, we learn some wonderful, uh, tremendous lessons on how to honor mother. Could you just write these down? Simple message this morning. I do ask for your attention, though. I think this will help everyone, whether you're a mother or not. And again, I thank God for you mothers. So please let this be a, a kind message to you and, and a reminder to us all. First of all, uh, in, in Ruth's example, we find, first of all, that we must be mindful of a mother's burdens. A mother's burdens. All of our mothers do and did have burdens. Ruth was one who recognized that and saw that. And I'm going to use Ruth, but also Naomi in this first thought. Because here's a woman 
Naomi, the mother, who lived in difficult days. Notice chapter 1 and verse number 1. It says, Now it came to pass in, those, in the days when the judges ruled. Now that's a statement right there that has enormous implication. If you looked into your Bible and looked at that time when the judges ruled, you'd see that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. When the judges ruled, it was not a good time. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And when you come to the book of Judges, Israel and the culture does this, a nosedive. It absolutely falls apart. It becomes difficult. It becomes dangerous. It becomes demonic. It becomes disastrous. That's the day in which Naomi was a mother. Immorality and idolatry was rampant, not just in the culture, but even in Israel as a people. War, tribal murder, and I'm careful to use these words in the pulpit, but there was constant uh, aggression against women in the book of Judges. You read it, and some of the most awful things recorded in the Bible take place in the book of Judges. Yeah. Horrible offenses against women, rape and, and, and uh, assault. As a matter of fact, I found this so curious, Pastor Brandenburg. I, I was reading in Judges chapter 18 several weeks ago in verse number 30. Of all the people to lead Israel into idolatry, guess who it was? Moses' grandson. His name was Jonathan. And the scripture says that he was a priest. And he led Israel to worship idols. I'm just telling you one, or pardon me, two generations out from Moses, the grandson of Moses is leading in the matter of idol worship. Difficult times to be sure. Difficult times for a mother. Judges 17, 6, three different times in the book of Judges, it says that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It's Old Testament moral relativism. You say, what is, what is that? Moral relativism is this. It's rampant today. Yeah. Hey, if it's right to you, it's right. Yeah. Do what you think is right. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not the way God works. It is not a Bible attitude to do what you think is right or do what you think is proper. The Bible is our guide. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible says in John 15, 3, Ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Folks, what we do ought to be through the word of God. Amen. That's the guide. That's the pattern. That's the instruction. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so that's the day that, that Naomi was a mother. So she, she certainly was a woman that, that, uh, that uh, had burdens. But let me say, secondly, she bore financial hardship. Look at verse number one again. When the judges ruled, it says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. You know, some I'm glad I'm American. You people need to wake up. I said, I'm glad I'm an American. I love my country. Did you know in this country there's never been a nationwide famine? Not one. Not one. There was a dust bowl. There was a Great Depression. But did you know during the Great Depression people did pretty good? Yeah. People think everybody died and starved. No, 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 they didn't. Wall Street did. Kind of Wall Street deserves it. Yeah. Farmers did pretty good. Yeah. They knew how to plant. Uh, we, we did pretty good as an overall nation. There's never been one famine in the United States of America. Amen. Prove me wrong. Try it. You know what I'm trying to tell you is we are a blessed people. Yeah. I said we are a blessed people. Yeah. I've got two cars. Raise your hand if you've got at least two cars. You better believe it. You try that in the Philippines. Yeah. Just now what I just did. Try that. Try that in Mexico. Right. Try that in South Africa. We are a blessed people. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. This woman knew financial burdens and hardships. There was a famine. And you know the truth is, there could be in this room right now somebody, a mother. I think about single mothers. Oh, thank God for a, a lady that's going to, whether her own fault or the abandonment of another, why she's a single mother. 
But thank God for a single mother that just says, I'm going to rear these kids. I'm going to grit my teeth. Are you listening to me? I'm going to do it on my own, and I'm not going to let somebody else do it. It's my job. I'm assigned to these children. They're mine, and she'll bear hardship for those children. I thank God for a mother that'll just bite the bullet and say, I'm going to rear these kids and do my best, and I'll give my very blood that these kids might grow up right. I was talking with a a beautiful lady just this past week, a a, a beautiful, in our city, a black lady, beautiful lady, and she's so grieved about her grandchildren. She said, everybody's influencing my grandkids, and she said, it's like my voice is getting more and more quiet. She said, I don't have, listen to me, what will help the black culture in this country is mamas get back involved in the lives of those children. And grandmas, listen, We need the wrath of godly grandmas. Somebody say amen. Amen. Grandma that won't put up with back talking and swearing. Amen. I feel like I'm preaching to myself today. (laughs) Grandma, if it's bothering you, tell them it's bothering you. That rotten, stinking music they're listening to, they blare that garbage when you're, don't let them do it with you there. Say, turn that off. I don't like it. Yeah. Right. So I don't want to impose my impose. Come on. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Yes, sir. Come on. What'd you hear at church today, man? Just a bunch of yelling. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You kids, listen to me. If I ever, ever said a word short to my mother, I found myself against the wall. Hello? Oh, don't look so sanctimonious. You, you needed is what you needed. You taught, you, listen, my mother was such that if you didn't right then do it, she was on, and my mother was a, a godly saint, but I'll tell you something, that woman had a backhand, hallelujah. <laughs> that, that, uh, right on, I mean, she'd just pop you on the forehead. Everybody all right this morning? Thank God for Mamas who just said, I don't care what it takes. There's nothing more important to me than that little girl or that little boy turning out right. I'm not going to turn them over to the school system. I'm not going to let somebody else in. Hey, my kids will only go where I let them go. And own your children. Own your children. Mom, you bear burdens. Don't trade those burdens to anybody else. Schools are not supposed to rear children. I've taught in the public schools. I've taught in all kinds of arenas. I've often said this, I wish I could have some of these kids for just two weeks. Some of them need their hind ends blistered a few times. I just can't believe, I can't believe he said that. I can't believe he said that. Yeah. Mom bore financial hardships. I was thinking about recently, my precious wife, and I don't use personal illustrations, but I have to give this. We had a preacher come over on a Sunday morning, preach for us, started our little church, and uh, about 30 people in the church, you know. And I said to her, I said, uh, you know, I'm good at this. Saturday afternoon, baby, I got a preacher coming over for lunch tomorrow. <laughs> she said to me, she said, what are we going to feed him? I said, well, we got, we got stuff. She said, we got noodles and beans and no butter or nothing else. Amen. <laughs> That's what I said. Amen. And she said, I'm not feeding him butter and beans or uh, beans and, and noodles. She said, I don't know what we're going to do. Well, I got real spiritual. I said, well, baby, God will provide. Buddy, as soon as I said that, I went out to the car. I turned the seats upside down. I went through the couch, the recliner. I went to neighbors' houses and went through their furniture looking for change. That's the honest truth. I'm telling you, I scrounged together about $2.70, and I went down to the store. And those, this is way back in the early, middle 80s. I bought what was called a seven bone. Anybody know what I'm talking about, seven bone? Yeah, it's just junk meat. You'd never buy it. 
It's just a chunk of meat with seven bones in it, little tiny gristle here and there, and a few little red strips of meat. But buddy, it makes some serious gravy. Can I hear an amen right there? So I bought that seven bone. I brought it home, had one potato. And I said, baby, we're God provided. And she looked at me, did not say a word. That's the worst thing could happen. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> Come on, men, help me. Who's the boss of the house? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm the head of my house, but she's the neck, amen? <laughs> but anyways, I, I've, we fed that, and Dr. Dr. Uh, Guy Finch was the, our guest preacher. And uh, so she, she's standing there, and Brother Welch, I'll never forget it. She says, ah, enjoy the meal. She said, I, I, I'm, I'm not feeling like I'm hungry at all. You women have done that. Because it wasn't enough. And she went off and went in the other room with the two little kids. And me and the preacher sat there. And I'm going to tell you something. I had a lump in my throat so big, I couldn't swallow anything. I was so upset with myself. So ashamed of myself. Didn't flap her. He got done and he, he thanked her for the great meal. And he went on his way. And I did what all good husbands do after you're in trouble. I cleaned up the table. I said, baby, you go lay down. I'm going to do the dishes and everything. It's on me. She didn't, she didn't let me do that. But I did pick up the plates. And Brother Greg, I'll never forget, I picked up his plate at $40, shoved under that plate. He stuck $40 under there just to say thank you. You see, God was meeting that need. And listen, I understand burdens, and I understand physical hardships, and I want to say to you mothers, thank you for enduring physical hardships, financial hardships. Thank you for that. See, she understood financial hardships, but not only that, I believe Naomi supported her husband. She supported her husband. That's going to get quiet here. You know why? Because sometimes we need to plow deep. We need to get our marriages back together. You say, what do you mean she supported her husband? Well, Elimelech, her husband, went to Moab and she went with him. Uh, she didn't say, I don't want to do this. I got my own ideas. He said, we're going to Moab. And I'm not saying it was right that he went to Moab. It evidently wasn't right. He, he went to Moab, a place of godliness, godlessness. And he, he, because of the famine in Israel, he went to, to Moab. But she supported her husband. And she has two sons with him. And it's interesting, there are two names. Notice what it says there. Verse 2, uh, uh, Elimelech, and then he had Mahalan and Chilion. Mahalan, the name it means puny or sickly. So most likely when he was born, he had some deficiency. Puny was his name. And Chilion, his name means this, vanishing. So probably most likely her two sons uh, were, were uh, 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 compromised physically and it becomes apparent because her husband Elimelech dies and then her two boys die. You want to talk about a bereaved mother but she supported her husband. And then let me say next, under this thought, talking about burdens she bears. She preserved through sorrow, or she persevered through sorrow. Look at verse number five. Verse five, it says, Now Mahalan and Chilion died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Here she is, they're gone. Everything she went to Moab with is now gone. And she persevered. She stuck with it. You know, no one, and let me just say this carefully, no one understands the pain a mother feels when she loses a child. If you're here this morning and you've lost a child, there, the, my, our two daughters both had what's called miscarriages. I don't like that phrase, but that's what we call it. And my daughter Lisa has so many times said to me, Daddy, do you think I'll know the little baby when... I get on the other side. I believe she will. That baby was made in the image of God, an eternal soul. And Jessica as well. And you know what was beautiful in their cases at least is that they had a miscarriage and then had a baby afterward. What do they call that, honey? They call that a rainbow child. Nobody's ever heard that phrase. So they're a, a promised child. And, uh, and, and it's a beautiful thing. But the truth is there are women here Many of you, and I don't need to identify, you live today with a hurt heart. 
You know, there's some things you just never get over. I know that's hard to say and certainly hard to amen. But there's some things that happen in life that alter you. And there's no doubt in my mind uh, the mothers here that have lost a child can relate to Naomi. She said later, she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Because God has dealt bitterly with me. I've lost my, my husband and my sons. But hear me, she persevered. She hung in there. And so be mindful of her burdens. Let me say secondly, verse 6 tells us that Ruth was mindful or thankful of her sacrifices. Could I say thank God for a mother's sacrifice? Look at verse 6. We read it uh, at chapter 1. It says, She arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she'd heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people and giving them bread. Naomi hears about the blessings at home, and this naturally this poor widow woman, she wants to return to her family, her home, her, her people. So she, in verse 7, uh, she returns and says, Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, it was Moab, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And she's, she says, we're going home. I'm going to go home. But she says in verse 8, look at verse 8. She said to her daughters-in-law, go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the, with the dead and with me. This verse tells us she told these two girls, Orpah and Ruth, go home, go to your people. Here's the sacrifice I want you to see. She lost her husband, lost her sons, and now she's telling these two girls, you stay here, go to your mothers. She's sacrificing. Isn't that just exactly how mothers are? Always putting others ahead of themselves. Come on, fellas. A real mother's that type. She puts her children first. She's a bear for her children. Amen. I love it. I love it that in our society, mothers are saying, no, you won't. <laughs> Woo! You don't mess with mama. Yeah. Help me, church. I love it. These women go to these school board meetings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get it. Son, you don't mess with a mother. I, I, I watched one of those YouTubes, uh, and that woman says, you're done speaking. The woman says, no, I'm not. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Then the police came up, and I saw the yeah. police, you know, they send the police to a school board meeting. Yeah. And that police officer said, uh, ma'am, you really, she said, no, I'm not. He went, okay, okay. <laughs> Naomi said, you go home. Go back to your home. Verse number nine, look at it. The Lord grants you that you may find rest. See, she's sacrificing. She's more concerned about them, Ruth and Orpah, to find rest, peace. She said, go back to your home. Have a new life. <coughs> Let me go on, uh, on my own. You be, you be happy. Rest. And I want to say to you, church, if there's anything that describes a mother, it's sacrifice. I remember this event in 1987. I just graduated from college a year before. And there's a, a road in, 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 uh, in Detroit called uh, Telegraph Road. And Woodward both run in that area. In 1987, the Northwest Airlines took off from Detroit Metro and crashed right on Woodward and Telegraph, killing everybody on board but a little four year old girl named Celeste. Anybody remember this story? It's astounding. And after the wreckage and after the fire was put out, they found this little four year old girl from, from uh, Royal Oak, Michigan walking around in the debris, looking for her mother. They couldn't understand what happened. They thought she was in one of the cars that got destroyed when the plane crashed. But she was on the, uh, you know, the list of passengers on the Northwest flight. Her name was there and her mother. They later determined how that little girl survived without a scratch. When the plane was going down, and everyone on board knew it was going to be a fiery crash. They later determined that that mother got out of her seat and wrapped her body around her little girl and embraced her 
to endure the impact of the crash. And that's why that little girl was unscathed in that wreck. That's a mother's sacrifice. Mothers, could I get your attention? Please, for God's sake, do that for your children today. Put your arms around them and don't let this world have your children. The drug culture, the porno culture, the liars of this day, put your arms around them and say, nothing's going to get my babies. That mother was that way. She was sacrificial. Naomi was this way. Not only that, let me give you this, I have to hurry because we're starving. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> she was aware of her burdens. She was aware of her sacrifice. But let me say this thirdly. Ruth was loyal to her mother in her later years. Her later years. Look at verse 10. It says, and they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee to thy people. Now this is Ruth and Orpah. And they said, Ruth, or Naomi, we're going with you back to your people. They said, we're sticking with you. And, and, and these two girls are this way. But, but one, one said, no, I'm going to go back to my mother. And Ruth said, I'm going with you. But before that happened, look at the speech of Naomi, verse 11. She said, turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there not yet sons in my, more sons in my womb? that they may be your husbands. Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight, and who should also bear sons, would you tarry uh, for them till they're grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And she gives this, this speech. Look at verse 14, and they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth, look at it, clave unto her. That's how we're supposed to treat our mothers. In their old age. Oh, listen, I don't have a clue what that means. My mother died when she was 44. Ha. Huh. I never got to see my mother. My mother always had beautiful auburn hair, but I found out later she dyed it. I saw, and by the way, I remember when she'd do it too. I never knew what was going on, but it smelled like eggs in the house. How many of you gr girls remember that? That hair, oh, some of you are admitting dyeing your hair then, okay. But, but my mother died 44. My wife's mother died at 56. We didn't get to be a, a, a son or a daughter to an aging mother. Could I say to all, be loyal to your mother as she grows older. Amen. In her later years, Ruth demonstrates a sincere heart by cleaving to her mother. Oprah decides natural causes. She said, I'm going back to my family, but Ruth goes against the nature. Verse 15, look at it. She said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back to her people, and unto her gods return thou after thy sister-in-law. And then Ruth gives her speech. And what a speech it was. Look what she says. She said, Entreat me not to leave thee, verse 16, nor return from following after thee. For whither, And these are some of the sweetest words in your whole Bible. Whither thou goest, I will go. Whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. There will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. She gives that beautiful speech, a speech of loyalty. Yeah. And could I just say praise God for you that are loyal to your mother as she ages. The aged mother. I wish I could do, I wish I could record some of my mother's thoughts. It's gone. It's gone. My mother five years suffered with brain cancer. She was five years dead before she died mentally. But while you have opportunity, record her thoughts. Put down the momisms. Am I helping anybody today? Write down the stories. Get your story written down from your mother's remembrance. And then 
despite her aging, Ruth stuck with her. I do want to acknowledge it gets hard though, doesn't it? It gets hard. The burden gets heavier, especially if mom's mind begins to slip and her health begins to slip. And I had someone one time years ago say, everything my mom is about right now is, is, is she needs and she needs and she needs and she needs. And this is what I did as they said that, like you were when you were a little child. I wasn't being unkind. But she needs and she needs just like you did. Be loyal in her latter years. But let me find it finish with this. Look at verses 19 and 20. Chapter 1. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them and said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. The Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. Let me just say this last thought. Be patient with your mother's faults. With her faults. I, I, I like to think as I get older, my mother becomes more perfect. But the truth be told, she had her faults. Uh, I was her favorite child, so that fixes a lot of it. But she had faults. And here she comes, 10 years after leaving Bethlehem, she comes back and she's so imprinted with her sorrow that the people said, is this Naomi? She's changed. And listen to me, here's a dear woman, a widow, a mother with a broken heart, and Moab stamped all over her. But Ruth stayed the course. Look at verse 21. The Bible says that Naomi said, I went out full and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call you me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? But guess what? Ruth does not in one way rebuke her mother-in-law. She just endured her faults. Could, could I just say this? Your job's not to correct your mom. Leave her alone. Don't try to change her. Just love her. Love her. Ruth stayed at it. And you know, the end of the story is pretty amazing. Ruth said, I want you to, I want you to meet that boy, Boaz. He's your father-in-law's brother. I want you to get to know him. And Ruth had no idea what was about to happen. But I want you to go to the fourth chapter, would you please? And let's see what happens. Because you know something? There's a rule in the Bible called sowing and reaping. How many's ever heard of that law, that rule? Yeah. What you sow, you what? So Naomi, with all her faults and all her difficulties and her burdens and her privation, she, she went back where she should have been and she's sowing. But look who gets to reap. Chapter 4, look at verse 13. Chapter 4, verse 13. It says, so Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. And when, it, when he in unto her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, remember the bitter woman? Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel, and he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age for thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him. Watch verse 16. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name saying, There is a son born to who? Naomi. It was Ruth's child. But born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David, the father of Solomon, the father of Jesus. Amen. I'm talking about that lineage. Oh, thank God. You see, when you sow, you reap. So I'm going to summarize it. Be mindful of your mother's burdens. Be thankful for her sacrifices. Be loyal 
in mother's later years and to be patient, be patient with your mother's faults. Let me ask you a question and I'm finished. You see what I'm doing? I'm closing my Bible and my notes and that means absolutely nothing. (laughs) But let me ask you a question. When your life is over, will God even know you? You see, Pastor, God knows everybody. He does, but you know what he said one day? He said, depart from me. I never knew you. There's only one way into God's family as you must be born again. Jesus came to this earth and died on an old rugged cross. He rose from the dead, God dying for man. And the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. Are you saved? Will God know you come judgment day? I was saved the 27th day of April, 1974. That changed everything for me. How about you? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I appreciate your attentiveness right on time. I want to ask you, though, this morning, if you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. And God has reminded me today of how good and how merciful he's been to me. And I want to raise my hand in thanksgiving. I know I'm saved. Here's my hand. God bless you. Going up all over the room. Thank you, thank you. You can lower your hands. Maybe you say, Preacher, I just don't know that I'm saved. I don't believe I'm saved and I need prayer. Would you pray for me? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you raise your hand? Let me see it. I'm just looking. I won't call you out or embarrass you, but you'd raise your hand and say, that's me. I'm not saved. Let me see it up and down. Please, let me see it. I just want to pray for you. Raise your hand up and right back down. Maybe you say, preacher, I'm saved. I feel like I'm not doing what I ought to be doing as a Christian. God has spoken to my heart, and I need his help today. Pray for me. Here's my hand. Let me see it around the house. God bless you. Here, 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 here in the back, over here. God bless you. Hands are going everywhere. Why should he love me so is the song. Let's stand together, please. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for forgiving us of sins. Lord, I pray if there's someone here not saved, God, that today would be the day. Young or old, help them right now to say, I need Jesus. Speak to their hearts right now. Bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.